What, what a wonderful privilege. And with that privilege of being a son of God and uh, why he loved us so, uh, we've been talking about uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. The Bible says, all things are become new. And we've been talking about what we get when we get saved. Uh, I didn't know all that I got when I got saved. I was eight years of age and I knew that I had salvation in Jesus Christ and He forgave me of my sins and washed them white as snow. But uh, as I began to live the Christian life and dig into God's Word, I found out all uh, the treasures, uh, as Paul said in Ephesians, the unsearchable riches of Christ. And I found out all the things that I got. I'm still praising the Lord for. Uh, if you would turn to Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, we found out last week that we got a new father in salvation. Uh, the Bible says in John 8, 44, he told the Pharisees, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. But when I became a child of God, I, I got a new father. I was trans... Uh, Heard from darkness into light. Paul says you were sometimes darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So I got a new father when I got saved. Paul, in fact, said we can cry, Abba, Father. That's, a, that's an intimate term uh, the Bible tells us about. I got a new family when I got saved. I'm born into the family of God. Uh, I was a child of the darkness, but now... I'm a child of the light. I can uh, have a new family. Uh, the Bible often refers to the family of God. Paul calls uh, the family the household of faith. And uh, we often think of uh, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul referred to Timothy as his son in the faith. He referred to Rufus as Cho uh, chosen in the Lord, his mother and mine. So aren't you glad for the spiritual mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters uh, that we get in the Lord? How, how precious uh, that is. And then we found that we had a new faith when we got saved. Uh, we had faith in the things of the world. We had faith in ourselves, maybe in religion, uh, maybe in our good works. But now we have faith in in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're, we're saved by faith and we're to live by faith. And I like that song we sing. I care not today what tomorrow may bring if shadow or sunshine or rain. My Lord, I know ruleth o'er everything and all of my worry is vain. I'm living by faith. So we're saved by faith and now we're to, to live by faith. But there's something else I get when I get saved. And I really didn't know it till I began to grow in Christ, is that we now we should bear a new fruit. We should bear new fruit. And Jesus speaks of this in Matthew chapter seven. He begins in verse fifteen. He said, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. And he says, But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewed down and cast into the fire. So he's warning the disciples of the false doctrine, the evil fruit of the Pharisees. He said, they have sheep's clothing. He said, but they're wolves on the inside. And you'll know them. You'll know them uh, by their fruits, uh, the Lord says. Why? Because they have corrupt fruit. 
And that's kind of fruit that they bear. And you can know them. And how is that uh, corrupt? Because it's contrary to the Word of God. It's corrupt fruit. But now that I'm saved, the Bible tells me that I'm to bring forth good fruit. Good fruit. And again, we, we see that picked up by the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, he talks about the works of the flesh are manifest. In other words, uh, manifest means brought to light. In other words, uh, a corrupt tree, it may have one good fruit on it, but eventually it's going to bring forth evil fruit. A good tree, oh, it may have a bad apple or so on it every now and then, but it's going to bring forth good fruit. But now Jesus says, uh, the works of the flesh are brought to light. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred. Boy, the fruit's growing, isn't it? Uh, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revilings, and such like. Of which I tell you before, as I also told you in times past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But then now he turns and says, but the fruit. But before we get into the fruit, let's go back and see what he said. Notice the little verb, do. They that, that they which do such things. Now again, as we rightly divide the word of truth, uh, it's what I said in my Bible class in recent days. Um, can a saved person act like an unsaved person? What do we say, class? Yes, yes. Can an unsaved person act like a saved person? What do you think? Yes, yes. Judas did. He played the part. He acted the part. Does it mean that a saved person cannot sin? Can a saved person do some of these things? Adultery, fornication, wrath and strife and even murder? David committed murder. You remember? Nathan told him, you're the man. You're the man. You killed Uriah. You sent him out to battle. And you took his wife. Oh, I know Dave was Old Testament. But again, uh, can an, a saved person do some bad things? Well, yes, they can. But yet, why does this verse say, they that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God? The key is in the little verb, do. It's the word proso. Strong's and Vine's expository word studies of the New Testament tells us that this verb proso implies to perform repeatedly. Strong says it denotes an habitual practice. An habitual practice. Oh, yeah. A saved person can sin. But Paul says, they which practice these things habitually, continually. What did Jesus say? A corrupt tree cannot continue to bring forth good fruit. Neither can a good tree continually to bring forth evil fruit. So the unsaved will practice these things. But a saved person, he needs to examine his salvation 
if he continually lives this kind of lifestyle and doesn't have the chastening hand of the Lord upon his life. Well, notice as he proceeds here, um, but let's, before we get into the fruit, let's again go to uh, John as he implies the same thing. In 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, we're going to rightly divide. I'll, I'll try to get through this. Help us understand what the Bible says. 1 John 3 and verse 4, Whoso committeth sin transgresses also the law. For the sin is the transgression of the law. Verse 8, He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that He might destroy the works of the flesh. Verse 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him. He cannot sin because he is born of God. Now many years ago I, I worked with a fellow. He was a, holy, a holiness. And of course a holiness to believe in the eradication of the sin nature. So he took these verses and he said, Now that I'm saved, I never sin. And he, and he quoted me these verses. And I, you know, he was a married guy and I was married and uh, I asked him, I said, well, I said, that's, that's pretty strong to say that you never sin. I said, you're married, right? Yeah. I said, well, do you ever uh, like say anything cross or something you shouldn't say to your wife or your spouse or you sometimes, you know, lose your temper or something? And he said, oh, yeah. He said, those aren't sins. That's just mistakes. Well, go figure. But I want to call your attention to the verb in these, all three of these verses, the word committeth. Verse 4, committeth. Verse 8, committeth. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Again, John changes the word. He doesn't use the word proso that Paul uses in Galatians that means uh, an habitual practice, uh, the word proso. He uses the word poiheo, poiheo. Now this word simply means uh, a um, process leading to an accomplishment. In other words, it, it, it implies uh, something that you do that leads to uh, an accomplishment or something in your life. So when I first read this verb and this word, I thought, well, um, it doesn't imply what I think it does. But when I dug a little deeper and checked into A.T. Robertson's word studies of the Greek New Testament, the word is in the present active tense. Now, we don't have that tense in the English, but in the Greek they do. The present active tense implies a continuous action. A, again, a habitual activity. A willful, habitual activity. And I said, aha. There it is. And what does he say? For his seed remaineth in him. What seed is he talking about? The Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit who lives within us. He cannot sin. But to understand that if you're born of God, that He's implying here, oh yes, you can sin, but you can't habitually practice sin in your life and be a child of God. He's telling us about our fruit. He's reminding us, oh yeah, a, a saved person can act like an unsaved person, 
But we need to examine our lives and say, you know what? I have an opportunity to bear a new kind of fruit now. Oh, I'll have a bad apple every now and then. I'll lose my temper. I'll get cross. And oh, uh, things will happen. But he says, but now that I'm saved, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness, faith, and meekness, and temperance. What did Paul say in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4 when he said, We are buried with Him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also should we walk in newness of life. And how do we walk in that new life? By the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. Again, I've often seen these fruit uh, I believe in three different areas in my Christian life. Three relate to God. Love, joy, and peace. The love of God, the peace of God, the joy of the Lord. Three relate to others in my Christian life. And what are those? As he tells us, they are long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. Now you remember what long-suffering is. It comes from two words in the Greek. Long temper. It's patience, uh, I think uh, one commentator said, not in regard to problems, but in regard to people. I like what one commentator said, it's just simply the church putting up with the family. You ever notice someone who had a short temper? There were four of us boys and we'd all ride in the back seat before we got, you know, that was before vans and things. And we'd all get in the back and we'd be elbowing each other and poking one another. And he would say, Mama, he touched me. Mama, he looking at me. And we'd all have a short temper. Sometimes that's what Christians are. We're short tempered with each other. <coughs> But Paul said the fruit of the Spirit is long-suffering. In other words, you, you put up with your brother and sister at home. You don't have a short temper. You put up with your brother and sister in the church. You don't have a short temper. You can't do it in the flesh. You can only do it in the Holy Spirit. And then what does he say? Not only long-suffering, but he says gentleness. Now, what's the difference between gentleness and goodness? I believe gentleness implies an attitude where goodness implies an action, an attitude. An attitude. David said, Thy gentleness, speaking of God, hath made me great. Do you have a self-righteous, arrogant, unreceptive attitude? Or do you have a gentle a gentle attitude. When people deal with you, do you have a good spirit where goodness is practiced on a daily basis by the actions and the things that you do, helping others, doing for others, and being Christ-like? Well, then he closes with three other kind of fruit that relate to myself. He says, there is faith, meekness, Intemperance. Again, faith implies uh, I'm to have faith in God and believe God. And only God can help me do that in the Spirit. Because the flesh wants to what? Worry, fret, be upset, doubt. But ask God to help me to demonstrate that fruit of faith. And meekness is a teachable spirit. And then temperance. We studied this in our Sunday school not long ago. Someone has defined temperance as self-control. But I like a better definition is Holy Spirit control of self. Temperance. You see, we live in a world where people are out of control. They can't control themselves about anything. But as a believer, we should have control of self by the Holy Spirit. If I were to walk up to you and pluck off some fruit, 
what would it be? Would it be one of these nine that are demonstrated by the power of the Holy Spirit? You see, Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruits. And He said, if ye abide in Me, that's how you bear fruit. You can't put up with family members or church members or brothers in Christ in the flesh. It takes the, the fruit of the Spirit. And as we heard from John Van Geldern, uh, it's singular fruit. So in essence, is it not putting on the Holy Spirit in your life? But I think the fruit implies a practical aspect of how to do it on a regular basis. Now I bear new fruit. Oh, the world, before I was saved, and the unsaved world, they seek to control themselves and they don't know how. But I found the secret. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Well, not only did I get a new fruit, but now I have a new future. You see, Paul said in Ephesians 2, I was dead in trespasses and sins. In John 3.18, he says, I was condemned already. In other words, I, I had a death sentence. I was a walking dead man. Paul says in Colossians, I was under the power of darkness. Why do people live such terrible, wicked lives. They're controlled by the power of darkness. He says in Ephesians 5, 8 that we were sometimes darkness. Isaiah says, My iniquities like the wind have taken me away. I don't think he meant the Illinois wind, but I sure believe, believe it sometimes when I feel that Illinois wind blowing the leaves. That's the way my sins were. He tells me in Corinthians, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. <coughs> the Mar, as you know, is the eclipse. And I went to the library and got some glasses for all the kids in the school. So I put those glasses on and I spoke in chapel. I wore a black coat, black sunglasses. Couldn't see a thing. I mean, I stumbled into class and I said, Hey, I need help. I can't see. One of the kids helped me to the podium. And I said, I'm in darkness. And that's what I was like without Christ. Pitch black darkness. The Bible says I was headed to a place of outer darkness. Where the worm dieth not. Where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. The fire is never quenched. The rich man's tongue wanted one drop of water. And Paul tells us in Thessalonians, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. But thank God for a new future. Paul tells me in Colossians 1.13, I was translated into the kingdom of His dear Son. I was translated. I was taken out of the kingdom of darkness and I was put in the kingdom of His dear Son. He talks about the gift of God which is eternal life. Whosoever liveth and believeth in Me shall never die. You see, this cemetery out here is filled with dead people that one day will be alive in Jesus Christ. The Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain will be called up. That's the rapture. Jesus, Jesus said in Matthew 22 and verse 32, God is not God of the dead, but of the living. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. 
Pastor Jared is uh, speaking on Revelation now, and I told him, well, I did that a few years ago, and it was such a delight, and if you can catch him on YouTube, you'll really enjoy that. And he's coming up close to heaven, and we were talking yesterday, and we were just preaching to each other, having a good time. And John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And behold, I will make all things new. I got a new future. All of us that are saved and you know the Lord. I began to search into this song and I wondered about it. And Andy Pickens Bland was born in, in Dallas, Texas, November the 13th, 1876. He moved with his parents, James and Allie, after he was about six years old. They moved to a little place in Alabama called Hansville, Alabama, right outside of Coleman, Alabama. And there they farmed. Andy grew up and became the song leader in Bethlehem Baptist Church. And one day, a lady named Mrs. Bridgewater gave him some words to a, to a song. It wasn't a song, it was just words. She disappeared from Hansville, Alabama in 1917. Her and her family never heard from them again. But Andy Bland took those words in about 1920, he put them to music. <clears throat> and he wrote the tune to this song. He was music director in his church. He died in 1938. And he's buried there in Hansville, Alabama. I've been there many times. And here's the song that he put to music. We read of a place that's called heaven. It's made for the pure and the free. These truths in God's word he hath given. How beautiful heaven must be. How beautiful heaven must be. Sweet home of the happy and free. Fair haven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be. In heaven no drooping or pining, no wishing for elsewhere to be. God's light is forever there shining. How beautiful heaven must be. Would you bow with me in prayer? Are you in the family? We have a new father, a new family. We have a new faith. But the Bible tells us we're to bear a new fruit now. Oh, and that fruit is not forced from the flesh. It's lived by the Spirit. Paul talked about the works of the flesh are manifest. Are the works of flesh manifested in your home, in your life? Sometimes they creep out, don't they? But the Bible says to walk in the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Be filled with the Spirit, the Bible says. And only the Spirit can bear that kind of fruit in a believer's life. Would you ask Him tonight to help you? Help you to be ready for that home in heaven and the fruit that we could bear in Christ. Father, uh, thank you for your many guarantees, warranties that come with being in the family. All these things, thank you for that wonderful truth. Help us to live as children of God, children of the light, and not to walk in darkness. Help us, dear Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.